Hi everyone, um, welcome you all joining us into our uh, panel about Jetpack Compose. And uh, I'm here together with uh, Florina, hey. which is uh, one of the developer relationship, uh, um, part of the developer relationship team, one of the uh, software developers, right? Uh, and Nick, Nick Butcher, that also part of the developer relationship team. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to start with, first of all, Thank you, thank, huge thank you for both of you like doing amazing job for our Android community, like to doing a bunch of talks. Like I grew on your talks, learning a lot out of them and like you're continuing to investing hard in that and like huge appreciation from me and also from uh, our entire community. So what are we going to do today? Do you have talk any about idea? Compose, talk about compose, compose, compose. compose. <laughs> Yes, and uh, <coughs> we prepared a bunch of questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, let's make it conversation and fun, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's composed, fun, <laughs> functions. Um, so can you brief us about like, what's the current state of the compose? Where it's heading to? What are you are aiming to achieve? And like, what's your goal? What's your dream? Okay. Uh, so Compose, I think right now we're at 1.2 beta. Um, but I think the most interesting thing is like, should you use Compose? Where should you use Compose? Um, I say if you're starting a new app, definitely use Compose. If you're building a new screen, I'd say do consider using Compose. Uh, definitely start trying out Compose in your app, see how it behaves, start learning Compose. And if you're a completely new beginner and want to learn Android, Start with Compose. Yeah, to add to that, I like, definitely agree with all that. But to add to it, I'd say like, our goal is to make Jetpack Compose the way you build all Android UI. Like the view system has served us very well. Uh, but, you know, it was built on 10 year ago assumptions and technology stacks. Uh, so this is why we you know, undertook rewriting, you know, a huge undertaking that it is to rewrite a brand new uh, like UI toolkit. Um, so yeah, we know that's a big undertaking and we have a lot of stuff we still want to build uh, to enable all the amazing use cases that developers have. Um, but yeah, that's our dream, that one day all Android UI is Jetpack Compose. That's where we're going towards. So I think what, what Nick is trying to say is that if you're building a new screen using views, probably you're building some new tech depth in your app. Yeah, um, it's great. Um, from the other side, like, uh, I have this uh, ring bells that say to me, like, wait, but we have, like, I'm newcomer to Android world, mm -hmm. right? And probably I'm going to maintain huge por uh, portion mm -hmm. of the code with using, um, I don't want views. to call it old, but using the view system, yeah, view yeah. system, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm still uh, like, kind of like, there are so many things that I need to learn. Mm -hmm. um, how are you suggesting like to, to, uh, to manage both these things? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I do think that there there is a composed mindset. There is a you know a declarative mindset that you need to to learn um, to be able to use compose. I, I think similar to Kotlin, there is a way to write you know compose idiomatic. Actually, I think that's one of the mistakes that we see people doing. That you know they're using compose, but in the end they're still using the same mindset as as views. So I think first of all, understanding what is the mindset of compose. I think we have a, a good talk, but I might be biased, uh, around the thinking compose that teaches you how to, uh, how to build your UI. Um, and then I think one thing I like about compose is that you, know, you can adopt it incrementally. So you don't have to you know, completely delete all of your screens and then write them from scratch in compose. But rather, we have a good interrupt story so that you can easily use compose from views or views from compose. So then you can do this like step by step in your own time uh, migration. Yeah, and to add to that, I feel like there's different ways you can start adopting Compose mm -hmm. as well. So we've seen some people who want to take, you know, all new features or new screens, perhaps we'll write it in Compose. And so it's kind of, you know, contained in one screen and another screen might be using view technology, for example. Or other um, people are taking more of like a, you know, horizontal approach perhaps where they're rewriting their design system so that, you know, this component is now Compose and perhaps they wrap that in the interop API so that perhaps they wrap that in a Compose view so that consumers can actually use it from the view world and then underneath it's using Compose. So there's different ways you can get into it. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, I don't think views are going anywhere uh, anytime soon, that people still need to understand it for now. We're hoping that all this interop um, technology kind of helps 
accelerate the path so we can help move people over because it's less than ideal to have to maintain mm -hmm. you know two set ways of doing things two sets of like learning you know mm -hmm. for us we're trying to maintain you know documentation samples code labs we understand you know there's a lot that people you know don't want to be in two worlds at once so we're trying to like you know bearing in mind that we want the future to be all composed everywhere and mm -hmm. um, trying to make it as easy as possible for folks to, to migrate. Like we've taken a lot of inspiration from, from um, Kotlin, in all honesty, mm -hmm. yeah. how, how great it was, the interop story. It meant that you, know, you didn't have to rewrite every screen, but once you got used to how amazing Kotlin was and you know, how productive you are, you kind of wanted to. And it, actually, I think we saw the migration from, uh, to Kotlin go like, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, been very- It was very impressive. Yeah, so we've been very, very inspired by this and like want to enable similar flows. We understand it's slightly different. You know, with Java and Kotlin, you're, it's maybe a one-to-one -one of concepts and it's different syntax a lot of the time. And then you can, you know, you can do the automatic translation and then try and make it, make it idiomatic. It's slightly more complex with UI because we've taken, you know, yeah. A fairly radical, like you know, rethinking of all of our APIs. You can't just take a recycle view and do right-click mm -hmm. convert because we want you. We don't want you to do that. We want you to like rethink about your data flow and like, does it make mm -hmm. sense? It's also not a you know like a one-to-one -one API uh, parity, but rather we look at use case parity. You know, like uh, things that you were able to build with uh, views, are you able to build them with Compose? So I wouldn't expect you know there isn't a you know recycler view in views. Is there a recycler view in Compose? But rather, what are the APIs? that enable the same use case. Hopefully we don't need all the animation systems <laughs> in Compose. Hopefully we have a slightly more rational set. Yeah. Um, so speaking about the adoption, so you mentioned Kotlin, and I think one of the biggest success of Kotlin was that actually uh, Google Teams, like Android, uh, Android Teams, have started writing by themselves in mm -hmm. Kotlin. Right? I heard this story from Eden and said, how about Jetpack Compose inside mm -hmm. Google. How do you use it? Like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, I know you have these massive apps like Gmail or, mm -hmm. or uh, Google Maps. Um, mm -hmm. Can yeah. you share a little bit of, about that? Uh, yeah, uh, I can try. Uh, so uh, the Play Store um, app actually uses Compose. They published Compose in production. They also actually wrote a really cool blog post about their experience of, of using Compose and their learning curve. Um, but while Play Store is definitely one app that's used in production internally, there are a bunch of apps that are already like starting to use Compose or investigating Compose or you know, just learning Compose. So I don't have a number to say like, oh, it's five, it's 20. Uh, but I do know that a lot of the teams are, are looking or starting to use uh, Compose. Yeah, we have an internal community. Like we learned a lot by working very closely. Uh, we, being like the Compose team, learned a lot by working closely with the Play Store team. Uh, you know, because having a large consumer who had very complex like business demands, like the feedback they were giving us were fantastic and definitely influenced the shape of APIs. Um, so we've been like building that out and building an internal community uh, inside Google for all of the you know Google applications and like rolling that that knowledge and experience out. So yeah, it's definitely growing. Amazing. And then um, I think one more thing, I think you mentioned maps. So uh, for example, when I think of maps, yes, you do have the maps app, but you also have the maps API. And actually we have a compose APIs for maps. So oh, yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I didn't like, wow, this is a great achievement. Okay. Yeah. Um, so speaking about like working with the different parts of um, uh, adopting technology, Kotlin, uh, there is like question that popping all over the places. Uh, what about aligning version of Kotlin mm -hmm. and uh, Compose? Mm -hmm. Seems like there is a lot of pain out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes. So basically, because it's a compiler plugin, we have to yeah. kind of build on top of like you know a stable version. Um, but the good news here is that we've had this pain and we've been working on on trying to um, like you know how to address it. So right now, um, mostly people adopt a single version of Compose. You kind of like you know you declare a single variable or whatever and use all the you know, Compose libraries um, monolithically. But we're actually trying to move towards um, in, like individually versioning um, subgroups of Compose libraries. So Android X .compose something would be versioned together, and the different something. So you know the compiler and the animation like yeah, modules, for example, might actually be versioned differently. And the goal here is to mean that you only the compiler really needs to depend on a specific version of Kotlin because that's where it plugs into the, mm -hmm. the Kotlin compiler toolchain. Um, so our goal is really to be able to rev that much faster. So and especially in a stable releases. So our goal is really to be able to update to support a newer version of Kotlin. So when Kotlin 1.7 kind of out, we can be able to rev with a, a patch release so we don't have to go through the alpha beta release candidate cycle. Um, 
yeah, so we're really trying to do that. And you might have a newer version of the, Kotlin, of the Compose compiler than you do of other Compose libraries. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's the future. We've already done it a little bit with some of the material free um, components that we're working on. That's differently versioned than the rest of the um, Compose um, layers. Uh, and the goal is that, yeah, we don't need to march them all in lockstep. They should be able to iterate at their own paces. You know, we don't need to rev a library just because other libraries are revving. Um, they should be able to release at their own rate. So that's the future we want to go towards. Uh, and a massive goal is to support being faster at getting stable support for Kotlin versions out there as soon as possible. Yeah. yeah, so then the Kotlin compiler, uh, the Compose compiler will go hand in hand with the Kotlin version. And then we already have actually um, a page on developer.tentor.com that talks about, OK, which version of the compiler corresponds to which version of Kotlin. So I would say that's, that's the page to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and then use the, the new versioning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So speaking about when it's going to happen, um, are you any plans, any plans to share your roadmap of the compose, like where are you heading to? And uh, we already do, actually. I don't oh. know. It uh, sounds like you haven't seen. There is a page out there. We have a public roadmap for Jetpack Compose. So if you Google Jetpack Compose roadmap, you should hopefully find it. Um, so we share details of what's uh, in focus. So we try and share what is likely to be coming. We're not committing to any release dates. It's software development still. Um, but you know the things that we're actively working on and things which are on our backlog, which you know we might not be getting to quite yet. Um, you know, we welcome any feedback and let us know if there's things which, you know, you think are higher priority than, than we're reflecting in that. But yeah, we try and actually, this is new for, for Google, the company which normally yeah. says we don't comment on future plans and whatever Jet normally says on these things. <laughs> uh, we actually do here. We actually publish a public roadmap. So yeah, um, it's amazing. I yeah. think like a great transparency in our understands where we're heading and uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. And that every new Compose table release, we're making sure that we're also updating the roadmap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, so there is a questions from the chat, from the live chat. Um, and one of them, uh, one, John Paul asking is like, what's the most difficult thing when building Compose to replace the view system in Android? Difficult. Yeah. What's the most Normally difficult? Normally the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll say right now, there are some things we haven't gotten to yet. Like I said, there's a lot of view to get the catch yeah. up with. Um, so something like shared element transitions, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we of working on it, actually. That's one of the things that we're, we're, we're actively working on. Uh, but you just can't do it right now. We just don't have the API surface. So there are some things like that which are harder. Yeah. I would say those are the things that we want to know. Like, what are the things that you want to build, but you don't find the, the Compose APIs for that? So let us know. Create an issue on the official issue tracker so we, it can inform our roadmap. Maybe. A slightly left field response to this is there's something we've taken more of an opinionated stance I think with Compose like thinking back to the view world um, we used to have like a button class for example and then if you wanted the material button you had to you know change your theme or view inflator or something to try and get like opt into the material styling so we ended up having these like very 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 flexible components where you could pretty much style everything um, but it was harder to achieve the look and feel like if you wanted to be like a material app so it, we weren't very happy with this because like, we were recommending people you know, use Material Design System. Um, but then you had to jump for a bunch of hoops as a developer. Yeah. You know, I've you know, written a bunch of articles telling people <laughs> how to do this. And it was, you know, it was work. And we tried to take a different approach with Compose. We tried to make the easy things easy. Like, you know, if we're recommending you use Material, then it should be very easy Indeed. to use Material, which is why we don't offer, there is no button that we ship that isn't a Material button, right? There it only lives in the Compose Material module, right? That's the only expression of a button. So we've made it easier to follow the defaults, but I think, you know, the flip side of that, like it's a double-edged sword, like all things in software, um, is that we've made it harder to, you know, we haven't baked in all the flexibility in the world. We've made it very easy to do make a material app, I think. Um, we try to have some flexibility into there. You know, some there's some parameters and so on that you can customize, but not everything is, an, is a dial or knob that you can you can fiddle, because that you know every parameter that you add makes it exponentially like harder to kind of use the default case in yeah. many ways. So we've been very careful about what we actually expose. I think sometimes we've got that right. Sometimes I think we need to iterate on some of these things, mm -hmm. but that might make it harder. So if you're trying to build something bespoke uh, and you're trying to start from you know the button whatever that we ship then I think we might have made it harder for you um, and that's a trade-off we chose that's a trade-off we chose to try and make the, the default case the recommended case much easier to do um, but yeah we'd love feedback like tell us if you think we've got the balance slightly wrong um, we have a like a philosophy of um, 
of layering. So rather than providing one monolithic thing, uh, if you look at Compose, it's built up into these, you know, there's a UI layer, um, then, which is like very fundamental concepts to UI. And then there's this foundation layer, which is this design system agnostic like components. And then there's the material components layer. And the idea being, if the material component doesn't satisfy your use case, you drop down a layer and you kind of reconfigure it. So if you look at the button class, keep going back to, it's not very big. It's kind of like, um, sorry, function. It's like, you know, 15-ish lines of code last time mm -hmm. I looked, because it basically assembles these lower level concepts into the, you know, into creating a button. But if you don't like it, then it very, it should be easy for you to um, fork it, to kind of create your own, yeah. remix it, add in the behavior you want. And we have some examples of how you might do this. But yeah, again, I think made many things easier at the expense of like try, uh, actually making some things harder, but I hope we've made the right choice there. Yeah, that actually there was one of the questions by Ziv that he was asking like, but on one side they have this huge flexibility, you can take a class, modify as you want, but then if you want to make a small changes, you know, for example in the slider, then you need to have this 1,000 lines of code copy into your system and, and to modify it like color, shape, etc. If you're having to copy over a thousand lines of code, then that sounds like maybe we aren't exposing all the right level of things, like maybe too much of it is internal or whatever that you need to copy and paste it over. So I'd love to hear any feedback, feature requests, bugs filed where it's too hard to do that. Maybe we should expose something. Like Again, this is like the art of API design, right? Yeah. Like how much do you expose? How much do you keep private? Uh, maybe we haven't quite got that right. I'm not sure about the particular use case. Um, but yeah, we've definitely tried to make it easier for the majority of people. Yeah, amazing. Um, so, um, you know, speaking about future plans, um, do we know any plans, uh, like obviously working together with uh, JetBrains about uh, building the Compose and Compiler, etc. Um, and we have these amazing things for the mobile world, but there is also other platforms like desktop and web. Mm -hmm. Any plans that you can share with us that... Uh, I'd say that right now we're focused on Android, and yes, indeed, we are working with, uh, with the JetBrains team for other Compose versions, but our focus is Android. Yeah, we're very excited about <laughs> multi-platform, and I think it opens up lots of options. Yeah, and like, sounds you know, very cool. We have been working with them, supporting the JetBrains team, all the amazing work that they're doing, and helping upstream some stuff where possible, and all the Compose projects are set up as multi-platform projects, you probably noticed, that's public. Um, but yeah, like Florian says, laser focused on making Android. We've got so much we want to do on mm -hmm. creating Android apps that that's our entire focus right now. We want to nail that before we go to other platforms. Yeah, for, for me, it sounds like very intriguing. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing some uh, web development right now and like, well, I wish I had this same Jetpack Compose into this web world, world mm -hmm. instead of using like React or, or, or Vanilla JavaScript to mm -hmm. manipulate the DOM. And it sounds for me like very amazing mm -hmm. concept. Um, so, um, speaking about Compose everywhere, um, obviously, uh, I remember when uh, uh, Compose just went out, there were a lot of performance issues, right? Um, and can you share about what the issues were, how they solved, and which areas, and what we as a developers need to pay attention when developing from Compose, like in terms of performance? Sure. I can't even remember what were the, those initial issues. Uh, I do know that, for example, with the Play Store team, we worked a lot on you know like performance around scrolling uh, and lazy lists. But do you remember any other issues? I mean, the biggest one we've been talking a lot lately about baseline profiles. Um, so because Jetpack Compose is completely unbundled, like you know, mm -hmm. it's. Um, statically linked inside your app. Uh, it means we don't benefit from a whole ton of optimizations the view system gets. Like yeah, maybe we need to explain what's the, not everyone know what's the baseline profile. Okay. Yeah. I feel like we've been talking about it a lot, but yeah, it's okay. The summary is basically um, view code or any code which is like fought from Zygot, so anything which is like native on the platform is already in memory, right? So. Um, you know, there's a huge, huge performance benefit to like startup and loading these classes into memory that you get simply by being a view app. By being an unbundled library, Compose has a lot of flexibility. You can adopt it at your own pace. You can ship, we can ship bug fixes much faster mm -hmm. and so forth. But we pay a cost in that, um, you know, the system has to load all that code into yeah. memory and it, it, it kind of it costs a lot more. And you especially see this um, if you're kind of just deploying from the IDE. So if you're building the APK uh, as debuggable kind of thing, we also don't benefit from all the performance enhancements you get from like RA and other optimizations and things like that. So a lot of people I heard have like seeing performance issues have been, well, we hear that they were kind of like just pressing the run button for a debuggable app. Um, so they're not benefiting from the RA and then they're also not benefiting from, from baseline profiles. Um, whereas if you build a release APK, oh, let me tell you what baseline profiles are first actually. So um, 
The Android runtime has a very clever thing in it where it can actually pre-compile um, hot paths of, um, in your app. So basically, um, the first iterations of this use what we call cloud profiles. So um, when your app was in the field, um, we would instrument it and see which code paths were hot and anonymize those and upload those to play. And then mm -hmm. they would be delivered when someone downloads your app so that and we can tell the runtime that, hey, this is the hot code pass, pre-compile these so they don't have to run in a slower interpreted mode. And that massively helps with performance, especially yeah. initial. I like heard like a 40% improvement in that. Huge, huge yeah. difference, yeah. Uh, and so what we've done is we've built on top of that work and allow you to ship these profiles. So rather than having to wait, you know, especially if you're updating your, your app regularly, let everyone week or two weeks. Yeah. It takes a while for Play Store to aggregate, anonymize, and, and kind of like build these, these profiles. Um, so now we let libraries and apps um, ship their own rules. Um, so yeah, using, uh, you know, if you check out one thing, if you're worried about performance, like profiles, the first thing, uh, but check out baseline um, profiles as well to, you know, tell the runtime that this is, you know, the startup path or some critical user journey. You actually use the macro benchmark library, so you tell us what the user journey is by writing a test, by writing a macro benchmark test. You might say, I want you know, the user to start the app and navigate to this screen, and you use that to generate the profiles which you then ship with your application so that when it's installed, um, the Android runtime can use that information to speed up your app in the first run. I mean, when you think about performance, I think one often thing that we see is developers saying like, oh, my Compose app is slow, but they're using a debug version. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the I know, first rules uh, when you think about performance is debug your, perform well, debug your performance in a release build. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's the number one. Yeah, we think we recently did a, a blog post about all the benefits of this as well. So mm -hmm. you can check that out on our Android Developers Medium account. Um, have you chance like to, to measure what's the was the memory overhead, if any, when using like mm -hmm. JP Compose versus uh, view system? I don't know whether we did anything around memory specifically. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not sure actually. <laughs> like no overhead. Uh, I'm not saying that. I'd say that profile we, your app. I'd say yeah, I'm probably, yeah. very, very <laughs> wary of like yeah. you know general rules around these kind of things. I'd say like you know profile your app and understand what your app's yeah. memory profile looks like. Yeah, um, amazing. So we have the Volody Leski asking like, can you list most popular view thinking examples in Compose? Um, I think where state is held. I think for me that's or in how you architect your app and who decides what happens where. Um, yeah, I think state handling. Uh, if, if you think about a view, usually take a, take a checkbox, for example. The state of the checkbox, whether it's checked or not, is something that was inside the checkbox. While with Compose, that's something that you, you raise at the higher level, at the caller level. So then in your, your function, you would Somewhere, somewhere else the state is sold, not inside that composable. Yeah, so yeah. to be re to build on that, like I saw someone ask, why isn't there like a radio group or checkbox oh. group, no, radio group um, for Compose? It's like, the answer is because you don't need it because you are in control of the check state. Like you host that in your like, you know, yeah. state holder somewhere else that you don't want that embedded in something else that you then have to synchronize with the source of truth. Uh, so that kind of question reveals to me that you know normally the answer is mm -hmm. you're thinking about it like in a, it in, a in a view kind of way in a compose kind of declarative mindset you don't need mm -hmm. these things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one question from the audience actually like I'm very curious because it's like a very hot topic somehow and we spoke about Kotlin multi-platform. So yesterday a lot of uh, folks uh, or a lot of conversation went around Fuxia OS. Mm -hmm. um, Anything you can tell us about it, like Roman's one uh, Roman group is very curious. Anything connected, happening, composed? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. No, I'm sorry. sorry. Okay, okay. Um, so um, back to our list of the questions uh, <laughs> that uh, we grab from communities. So we're speaking about view thinking things, like, um, but you obviously working a lot with uh, different developers with the different mm -hmm. companies and use cases. Um, can you share with us like what was the co most common mistakes that developers have made when building uh, a Compose app, my like Compose use? Mm -hmm. Like I can think like uh, always re-rendering your entire screen. Yeah, instead I, of like I, th uh, I think Florina yeah. already mentioned before about like getting the declarative mindset. I think mm -hmm. is the biggest one. I think Compose is such a change in how you think as well. So um, you know. You'll, we've been so used to imperative coding or understanding, like you know, 
when something will be called. So it's such a mind shift to mm -hmm. thinking to like, okay, I'm going to get rerun and where I'm reading, the scope in which I'm reading a variable mm -hmm. has a massive, massive um, effect on like the runtime performance and so on, like what will recompose essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something I think it takes a while to get your head around. I'm actually really hopeful. I've, I think there's a lot we could probably do in tooling to help like visualize this, like uh, understanding, you know, the impact of where you read a variable and how that's going to affect the kind of mm -hmm. like, performance characteristics of the code you write, uh, I think is you know a mistake, a learning journey that I've seen a lot of developers going on, uh, and yeah, and tooling I think can really help here. I think to to help with this, uh, what we release actually in the latest version of Android Studio is a recomposition count. So this means that you know you use your app uh, in Android Studio and then you're able to see like oh this composable actually recomposed a lot of times. So it's easier to be like okay some something fishy is, uh, is going on there. So a lot of times it's around like state handling. I think that's why I think about state because the way you handle state is also something that has a big impact on, on recomposition and how many times your UI um, recomposes. I think it's also quite interesting as an API design challenge for ourselves. Like concrete example, we have two offset modifiers, right? One of them accepts like a DP value, which you can offset an element by. The other one accepts a Lambda block, which you can um, provide um, an offset uh, at runtime. And they have kind of very different performance characteristics. Like, um, so basically, one of them is great if it's a one-time thing that you only want to be applied once. Whereas uh, if you then call it repeatedly, so say you were trying to move something in response to a scroll or an animation, um, it's way more costly because we have to recompose then to recreate that modifier every time, as opposed to the, the one which accepts a Lambda provider, um, which just has to kind of like remeasure and relay out and draw rather than recompose. Um, so the, I think that's a real API challenge as well, like getting, how do we design the APIs so that developers don't hold it wrong? Or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I think that's kind of almost, you know, on us to try and like guide people towards the most performant or optimal way to write the code. Um, so I think that's, you know, challenging. That's like a hard thing to get your head around. Like, you know, how do I know uh, when I'm looking at the documentation, I shouldn't use this. Like, how do I get that intuition that you probably develop after a little while that, oh, if a parameter is changing frequently, um, it's going to cause recomposition every mm -hmm. time unless it's skippable and lots of things yeah. like that. I think it's also, so for example, when you talk about compose, we also talk about like different phases of, of composition, layout draw. Like, I think ideally you don't even need to know all of these things because the APIs are just so intuitive and easy yeah. to use and do things as, as they should. But I think until we get there, we still might have functions uh, with two different signatures. Are you planning to build any specific profiler for the Jetpack Compose, like for an efficient stuff and happening, like same as we have today for memory and CPU? Well, recomposition count is a specific for Compose. Uh, and then we have a few other tools that are specific to Compose, like the um, uh, Animation Inspector. We have a lot of uh, what is it, preview, live edits. Mm -hmm. These are specific to Compose. Yeah. I think the, yeah, the general profilers mm -hmm. work for it. I think we're trying to like, make sure we're providing enough information as well to help you understand it, to make it usable. So I think like the phases you mentioned before, so like going through recomposition, measure, layout, and draw. Mm -hmm. um, I think making sure that information or maybe a view on the information to understand when stuff is happening might be interesting. Yeah, so trying to expose all the information like in the yeah. right tooling or like working on specific mm -hmm. tooling where appropriate. Lint rules. Maybe yeah, more. I mean, we already ship a ton of lint rules, um, but um, I'm sure companies can like, you know, benefit if they have specific rules that they want to apply on their mm -hmm. code bases. Like we have to be a little bit more conservative or maybe ship them disabled or warnings or something. But mm -hmm. yeah, lint rules definitely help. If there are lint rules that you want to see from us, we'd love to hear. Uh, the use cases. Yeah. Um, so Alexander Semenov asking, like, what's the resource guide would you recommend to multimodal architecture with Compose? Uh, E.g., like navigation between models. And actually, it also was one of the, my questions. Like, there is a lot of question mm -hmm. around architecture, mm -hmm. right? And also there is a navigation Compose that mm -hmm. recently was released. So, um, what are your thoughts about like uh, which architecture we should use? How to build this uh, navigation right? <laughs> Oh geez, how long have you got? <laughs> uh, that's a lot. I feel like yeah, could, it's like you could just, do a forty minutes really, like, only talk six on minutes, each of these topics. Throw a bomb yeah. on you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in terms of architecture, I think you can pretty much use any architecture you want. But the the one with uh, we recommend is uh, the one from the updated guide to app architecture. Um, I'd say so. Actually, at Google I/O, we we released uh, now in Android, which is a a more complex sample app, and I would say do 
check that one out. I think the Compose samples that we have are really good for more you know, focused um, API samples, but if you want the, the big picture, including like navigation, modularization, and so on, check, check out that sample. And if I'm not mistaken, we just released a modularization guide, right? A learning journey, I think, on for now in Android. So yeah, I think that's the sample to check out. Yeah, I mean, modularization is a very interesting topic on of itself. Like, I think there's a lot of ways you could approach it. And yeah, this learning journey uh, is very interesting, which describes how this app, um, you know, applied modularization. And so for navigation in particular, we took the um, decision to expose a specific navigation module for each feature. Um, so it can keep some um, things like private to the, the module, so you don't have to expose everything and depend on everything and expose just the you know the roots in a kind of type safe way rather than having to expose um, strings specifically which i think is a really interesting mm -hmm. approach uh, so yeah definitely check out now on android for how we approached it there uh, and i think in general check out our documentation i I'm, i hope a lot of these questions or all of the questions that we get uh, today are also answered through in our pages yeah so there, there's a lot of actually questions about so we mentioned a couple times about different resources mm -hmm. right we publish this guide we, we have this uh, blog post um, for the folks that um, you know, want to find the, all these best practices, guidelines, mm -hmm. where they need to head to, like mm -hmm. where they find all these yeah. useful resources. D.android.com slash compose. Yeah, so everything is there. Yeah. That's your front page. That's the, the, the main, the, yeah. Like all the code page. labs and the uh, guided best practices architecture. They're, they're linked through there. I think we also have a compose pathway, I would say, just Google for Compose Pathway or gl.gle slash compose dash pathway. Um, probably that was too fast. Uh, but yeah, uh, the Compose Pathway contains an ordered list of all of the code labs, so you have a nice learning journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know it can be overwhelming. There's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of documents we have out there now, like um, you know, which is great. I think there's a lot more information, but it can be overwhelming. So yeah, the pathways are really nice, structured way to learn if you want to kind of be guided through your learning journey. And I think we have questions, uh, last two questions, like short ones. So there is a question, like it's always rising, like I've heard this a couple of times uh, coming from the Sergei Kauk uh, about Flutter, right? And uh, now we have Compose and like we have this declarative UI in the Flutter as well. So like it seems like the two different products that are kind of competing with each other and they both coming from the Google. Mm -hmm. So w w what what's happening like and like you mentioned like if you're starting a new app, start with the Jetpack Compose, but why not in Flutter? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Uh, yeah, well, I think Flutter is an interesting technology, and like the, especially the multi-platform aspects of it. So if you you know have a very limited kind of like mobile team perhaps, and you want to hit both platforms, multi-platform, then you know it can be a great fit for your use cases. Uh, we're laser focused on like building the best Android app that you can um, with Android's native toolkit. So we think that you know this approach has a lot of benefits. So if you're trying to build the best Android app that you can that integrates with like all the platform features and like you know all the you know SDK support and all the community of like libraries and experience, mm -hmm. um, then kind of that's what we're focused on. Um, so I think you know it depends on your use case, depends on your team size and resourcing and experience. Like if you're like Kotlin developers, then I think you're gonna probably ramp up much faster on, on Compose. Probably. Um, so yeah, I think they're different technologies with different, you know, potential yes, yes, use cases. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So um, we're almost done. So <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. Fun. It was actually. It was, I, I didn't notice that. Like, oh, like almost half half, half hour. Where <laughs> you're talking. Well, yeah. Um, so um, you know, I just want to finish first of all um, by saying thank you for you, uh, and you know. Um, there's a huge community uh, that actually, you know, using your tools, learning from you. But I want to ask the opposite, like how we community can help you to do uh, your best job, like even better. Oh, I, I have an answer for this. Um, oh, great issues. Like uh, we want to know what's not working. If you have, I don't know, performance issues, let us know, give us an example of how to reproduce that performance issue. If you're trying to Build a use, build something, and you feel like the Compose APIs don't exist for that use case. Create an issue. So, yeah, create an issue. The issue tracker. I think that's one mm -hmm. way. Yeah, totally. That tell us what you want. Like you know, we need, want to build the best toolkit that we can that satisfies you know 
you know, all the use cases you're trying to build, the amazing stuff. So if we've missed anything, file an issue or come talk to us on Slack. If you go to developer.android.com slash compose, then right at the bottom there's a link to um, the Slack or the Slack. yeah or how to file a feature request or issue. Um, so come talk to us. Tell us tell us what we're missing. Yeah. Amazing. So again, thank you for being here, for joining us and Thanks sharing for your experience. Us. And uh, I think we're done. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.